Can you check if you're muted, please? Uh, 
Okay, so uh, usually that means that you're gonna want to build a, an inverted index. And an inverted index uh, is simply something that associates uh, to each term a list of uh, sorted uh, list of uh, a sorted list of the queries. And this simple data structure is sufficient to uh, actually uh, compute any kind of Boolean query. So I'm, I'm going to explain rapidly how our intersection works. So assuming that we are trying to uh, find all of the documents that are matching the query Rene and Magritte, we are going to have like these two uh, posting lists. We take the first one. The first document of the first one is two. And we are going to seek uh, into the second uh, posting list uh, for the document two. Um, so by seeking, what I sh mean is that we are going to do exactly as if we are advancing, uh, broad, go going through the, scanning through the, the second posting list. And we are going to stop at the moment where we find a document that is greater or equal to the document. If it's equal, then that means that two is in the intersection. If it's greater, then it's not. Uh, so here yeah, it's not, uh, and we found the document five, and we are gonna like do symmetrically. We are gonna seek for five in the first uh, posting list. Here we go. Five was found, so it's gonna be in our output. Uh, we can advance the first uh, posting list, and now we are seeking for seven in the second list, and so on and so forth, uh, until we reach the end of one of the posting lists. So. The only takeaway there is that if you want fast intersection, you need to uh, have a fast uh, way to seek through the posting list. Uh, for union, it's uh, it, we could use the same strategy. Like basically, it's like the merge. I, everybody has a different name for this algorithm, but we could merge put those two posting lists and and get the union, but that's actually uh, inefficient. So I'm using the same trick as uh, Lucine does. The idea is that you prepare in advance some kind of bit set uh, here. And uh, so just for the sake of this slide, uh, the bit set is actually uh, of length 8, but in TON TV, uh, we're using 4096 bits, so it's much larger. And what we do is that we are going to take uh, the first posting list, and we are going to so, so we, we are going to append uh, all of the docs that are between 2 and 2 plus, uh, so this horizon, uh, in this case, uh, 8, but in TON TV, 4096. <laughs> uh, and we append those documents in this bit set. So in this bit set, the first bit will mean 2, the second bit will mean 3, and so on and so forth. We do that for the first posting list, and we do that on the second time on the second posting list. Here is what we get for bit set, and now we can flush it. So we transform basically this bit set into uh, the document that it represented. So it can be done quite fast because uh, your CPU usually has an instruction to pop the uh, lowest significant bit out of a 64 bit world. Um, so you just pop it and, and, and so on and so forth. All right, so that's how uh, an inverted index is used uh, to compute Boolean query. Now the question is, how do we represent that on disk? So TON TV is uh, relying on MMAP for all of its I.O. And when you start TON TV, the only thing that it does is basically I'm mapping all of the file of the index, so it goes really, really fast. And it's ready to go. So uh, we don't have to load any data structure and put that in uh, an anonymous memory and, and like have some kind of hash map in anonymous memory. Everything is on MMAP, so it, the startup time is very, very nice. But that means that we need to have uh, data on the disk that is usable as is. Uh, for Java people, anonymous memory is more or less like the heap. <laughs> uh, 
So the first data structure that we are going to have to uh, you have in our index is the term dictionary. So a term dictionary uh, will be our term dictionary will be broken down into two steps. Uh, one step will associate the term, so like the sequence of bytes associated with the term, to some kind of term ID. And then we're going to have another data structure that associates the term ID to some kind of term info structs that I'm that basically like have pointers to files and uh, like the, the beginning of the posting list uh, for instance. I'm not going to talk about the second data structure because it's boring, but let's talk about the first one. So how do we go from terms, sequence of bytes to a term ID? Uh, so if you are actually trying to build your own uh, Search engine, you will have two broad kind of family for this solution. One could be like hash based in general. Maybe you will go fancy and have like perfect hash or something like that. It's a very nice solution in the sense that we, you, you, you would get like very fast lookups. And especially if you uh, don't have much RAM and everything is sitting on your hard disk, uh, you, you will probably require very little uh, IO to do that. Your hash map will be able to send you directly in the right place on your disk. Another solution is uh, using uh, like a tree-based solution or the, the, like a try. Or, uh, so this uh, will uh, require, this will use uh, slightly more CPU. And uh, you will have a lot more random IO. Uh, so that, that kind of depends on uh, the layout of your data. But uh, you tend to jump from one node of your try to another node of your try. So that might be a lot of six uh, if your data is, uh, is on your disk. Um, so, but it has a lot of benefits. So one benefit is uh, you can iterate through a range of keys. Uh, you can, so it, naturally you will probably use uh, term ordinals. So by term ordinals, I mean if uh, uh, Arabica is your first word in uh, your dictionary, then it will get term ID zero. Uh, uh, it, the, the first word uh, sort when sorted lexicographically, I mean, and then the second word might be uh, something starting by a B, then it will get term ordinal B, uh, ter term, <laughs> term ordinal two, and so on and so forth. So term ordinals will, uh, ter ter your term ID will be sorted exactly the same way as uh, your terms. That's a very nice property. But more importantly, uh, you can do an intersection of uh, your try or your try-like structure with a DFA. So uh, are you guys familiar with uh, what a DFA is? OK. We'll, we'll still explain it a little. I actually made a mistake in, uh, in the DFA here. But uh, so that's one. So DFS stands for deterministic finite automaton, and that's one way to implement uh, regular expression. So you can transform any regular expression into uh, an automaton like this one. And the way it works is uh, once you have it into uh, this shape, uh, then matching a string on this automaton means that you're going to consume every uh, charge in your string you start in the state over there. I, I was hoping I could point on stuff, but you can jump. <laughs> uh, so you, you start in the white state over there. And uh, let's say that you are trying to match carousel. Your first char is C. You look at the outbound uh, arrows that are emitted by the state you are in. Oh, one is labeled with a C. So that means that after consuming the C, I'm in that state, the yellow one. And then carousel, second letter is an A. I'm going to follow this letter, uh, this arrow. And I'm in the blue state. Uh, R, I end up in this state. And Usel, <laughs> until the U, U C, I guess, uh, without the L, uh, will be following the arrow with a, a star over there. <coughs> and uh, then the last L will uh, bring me to the end state. Uh, so it's really nice because I'm advancing well, one char at a time. I, I just have to look at the state of uh, the, the end state of my string to say whether I matched or not. I mark the states that match by a, a double circle here. So our try looks like this. And 
it's it's actually possible to match the this DFA over the try very efficiently. So I'm going to show how it's done. Uh, so here, if we consume the C, we end up in the yellow state, just like for carousel. If I consume the A, I end up in the blue state. If I get a B, then I end up in this gray state, which happens to be a sink. So the sink is a dead end. We will never match if we reach this state. We don't need to see what happens with the um, following characters. And that's great, because that means that all of this subtree, we don't care about it anymore. So for the purpose of fitting things into the slides, uh, this try is very simple. But you can imagine that maybe there is a gigantic uh, tree that is uh, a, a, ch a child of uh, this node. And we just cut that. So that's much, much faster. And now we want to match M. We don't have to recompute what is a state required for A. We can just look at the state of A before. So that's blue. And we see that we are in the sync state uh, again. And, and so on and so forth. So we are just putting colors of our try to guess uh, which, uh, which term in our dictionary uh, are matching our uh, <coughs> deterministic finite automaton. That means that I can go through all of the terms that match a regular expression, but also I can get very rapidly all of the terms that are at Levenstein's distance or edit distance of one or two. So that means that if you are asking me please uh, stream me all of the terms that are one typo away from what I typed. I can do that very, very efficiently. Uh, so TonTB is using uh, a like, tree-based uh, solution. It's actually using a finite state transducer, using those two. And I didn't have to code anything. The Rust ecosystem is nice enough that somebody already coded uh, a very nice implementation of a uh, finite state transducer. I will not explain how it works because I didn't code it. But the uh, thing that you might want to know about it is uh, it's pretty much like a try, except, except that uh, nodes can share suffixes. So you, you a, a try will never have an error that goes like this, right? Uh, so it, because it can share suffixes, you end up with something that is slightly more compact than a, a try, uh, and that's always a very nice feature when you're paying space with your RAM. Now let's talk a little bit about how we are going to encode uh, posting lists. So posting lists are a lot of integers. It's going to take a, a, a lot of the size of uh, your index. And you're going to want to compress them. Uh, integer compression is a field that has been well studied. There is a lot of solution to do integer compression. Uh, I, I, I put a chart over there, but basically uh, my point here is uh, you have a trade-off between uh, something that is compressing a lot. So it's always like that, right? You, you have to choose with something that compresses a lot and something that is very fast. Uh, another thing that I need to point out is basically all of the algorithm over there and yeah, all, all of these, all of the best algorithm, they're all using uh, CMD instructions. So CMD instructions are uh, instruction on your CPU that makes it possible for you to process uh, four or eight uh, integer at a time. So that's something that uh, actually TonTV is using a lot. So TonTV is actually using uh, this guy over there. Uh, so it, it's a it's a compression uh, scheme that has been uh, designed by uh, Daniel Lemire. I recommend you to read this blog. It's always very interesting if you're interested in uh, in things related with uh, search or data structures. Uh, I used to depend on uh, his library actually in C, and I removed it because I I prefer to be entirely in Rust, and I uh, re-implemented it entirely in Rust. Uh, the gist of it is, uh, like many of those schemes, uh, your posting lists are increasing. So it starts by doing uh, something called delta encoding. So instead of compressing your integer directly, what you do is that you take the difference between two consecutive integers, 
and you get something that is much smaller. You take a pack of those. Uh, so, uh, in uh, in my case, uh, blocks are 128 integer uh, long, and out of those 128 uh, deltas, you look at the one that is the largest. So I think in this example, that should be this one, that's 16. Uh, and it can, you notice that it can be represented using five bits. Uh, so what you do then is that you represent all of your deltas um, over five bits, and you just concatenate uh, this version. So that's called uh, bit packing. So I described what was the solution for uh, like the scalar version of bit packing. Uh, what I do is actually I use a CMD instruction for that, and I do that with uh, four integers at a time. For, so I decode four integers at a time, and the algorithm really looks like uh, like this trick that we were using at school to avoid like writing lines uh, when we are punished by our professor. So it it use exactly the same algorithm as the scalar solution. You just use CMD instruction in place of uh, like the scalar instruction. It's very, very simple. Uh, and it, there is uh, an interesting improvement uh, compared to the methods that existed before uh, Daniel Lemire's paper, which is uh, the algorithm also take advantage of the fact that as we are decoding um, those integers, we end up at one point where we have one register with the delta that uh, we are decoding, and we can decode the delta using CMD instruction as well. So this is also CMD instruction, and we do that at the point where they are already in the register. So it goes really, really fast. And we're talking about when I say fast, to give you an idea, I'm talking about four billion integers a second. So we are already very, very we're flirting with the bandwidth of your RAM, basically. Uh, so I, I told you that Rust was nice and was able to uh, compile like very efficient code that it was very close to C++ and so I wrote that in Rust and this is the assembly that is generated. I'm not going to tell you that I understand what's, <laughs> what's in there. Uh, but the uh, important point here is that all of the like long looking instruction over there, every single one of those is working on four bytes at a time. And you, you will see scalar instruction maybe here, here, here. So <laughs> the, the assembly code that is generated is really as good as possible. Uh, it's very, very close to, it, it, it's probably exactly the same as what we had in, uh, in C++. Uh, so I think we talked this morning a little about uh, BM25 and TFIDF. Uh, this requires to so the, those are like the scoring, uh, the default scoring function of Lucene. Uh, TantiV comes in with BM25 also. Uh, this requires to have access to the term frequency uh, as we search. So when we match a document, we need to have access to the number of times a term appears uh, in the document. And uh, it's nice to have good locality for that. So uh, we actually interleave uh, blocks of doc IDs with the block of term frequencies so that we are likely to have it uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a nice cache uh, at the moment where we are reading the, uh, as we are doing the match, uh, uh, as we are running the query. Uh, so we have uh, one block of doc IDs and then one block of term frequency and so on and so forth. Each block is uh, representing 128 blocks. So unfortunately, posting disks are not always exactly a multiple of 128 blocks. So the last one is using a different compressing scheme. That is not interesting. <laughs> uh, and so we also need to have uh, the information of how many bits are used to encode each block. And we also would like to have some way to avoid uh, decompressing this block if we are running in intersection, for instance. Uh, maybe the document is not in this block, and in that case, we would like to entirely avoid uh, decompressing it. So for that, we have another structure on top of that that allows us to uh, precisely skip 
and go to and, and decompress only the, the blocks that might be interesting. We're going to talk about uh, something else now. Uh, so I said in the beginning of the talk that we wanted to be able to index an arbitrary large amount of data. I use the word terabytes. Uh, and that's a big problem because if we have a reduced amount of RAM, how are we going to be able to build like this nice data structure on disk? We have another problem, which is people might like create an index and they want to add new documents. We want something that is dynamic. We want to be able to add documents to an existing index. That's another problem. And it happens that the solution is the same for both of these problems. So just to refine the idea of uh, why, why it's difficult to add new documents in an index like that. So the, the data structure that I described to you on disk is extremely compact, right? Everything is super compressed. Everything is laid out on, on disk uh, one after the other. Uh, so it, it really, if it was a bookshelf, it looks like this. And if you're in front of a bookshelf like that and somebody gives you a a, a book and tells you to put that in the library, you, you're going to suffer. You're going to have to move everything away. It's a nightmare. What you want is to have something that looks like that if you want to update your bookshelf uh, all of the time. So generally speaking, uh, there is a trade-off between being dynamic and, uh, and, and, and being compact. Uh, so there is a nice trick that exists in uh, many uh, databases that is called the log logarithmic method. The idea will be, we're going to have like compact bookshelf like that, but we are going to have many of them. So the way it works is the user will uh, tell TV or will tell Lucene, hey, TV, I will give you a budget of, let's say, 300 megabytes. And this 300 megabytes would be used for the dynamic bookshelf here. So there's going to be a big bookshelf, and people will <coughs> add books uh, into that until the bookshelf is, uh, is full. Once the bookshelf is full, we are going to transform it into a very compact bookshelf. So in, I, I'm going to stop with the image here. But basically, we, we serialize our dynamic data structure into the static data structures that I described before. Uh, and this uh, piece of like very compact index is called a segment. So that's a word that you probably heard in uh, in Lucene, but that's a segment. And both in Lucene and uh, in Tant TV, uh, there is a strong architecture of choice. A segment is basically an independent index. So you could literally like pick a segment and and copy it into another index, and it will run just the same as long as the schema are the same. That's a very interesting property, actually. So if we do that, we are going to end up with a lot of uh, compact segments. And maybe that's not optimal. Uh, if we have a one terabyte of, of data, that would be a lot of uh, small segments. And when we do a search, we are going to have to do as many lookups uh, in the dictionary. And that's uh, very inefficient, right? Uh, so on the background, we also have a process that merges those segments together. And you can actually control, uh, you, you can define on your own as a user what is a like, strategy used to merge uh, these segments. But it comes with a default uh, strategy called the log merge policy. And the heuristic behind it is just we try to merge. Uh, by default, it's going to be eight segments that have about the same size. Uh, and, and yeah. <coughs> <coughs> so this technique is also really nice, because that means that uh, we can do multi-threaded indexing very, very uh, easily. So TV uh, asks you how much data you give as a budget, and also how many indexing threads you want to use. Uh, and then when you open the document, what you are doing is that you are appending the document to a document queue. And you, in the background, and you don't control it, but there is uh, uh, your given number of indexing threads that are consuming this document queue and that are populating uh, 
these dynamic data structures that I was talking about. And once they reach uh, their capacity, then they're going to serialize the segment. So the serialized segment is a, like stat so the very compact data structure that we use in the end. And uh, some merging thread will merge those uh, very transparently. Yes, thank you. Uh, so there is a bunch of pros and cons to uh, to this. Uh, one problem that uh, is uh, very evident when you use uh, Tant TV, and I think it's still true for, uh, to some extent it's true with Lucene, is that uh, you when you add a document, it's not searchable right away. So it's quite puzzling for people who are using uh, SQL database. Uh, because we decided to have uh, our segments to be independent index, they do not share any dictionary, and that's uh, sometimes that makes uh, like specific usage of, of search difficult, not to be able to to, to actually uh, merge the result from the different segment very easily. Uh, yeah, there is not one dictionary. Uh, I didn't talk about deletes and updates, but those are an absolute night nightmare. It's very complicated. Uh, yes, that's pretty much uh, all I have on this slide. And then uh, the pros will be uh, the index throughput is actually excellent. Uh, if you can batch stuff, if you don't have to commit all of the time, you can re-index a gigantic amount of data. So. Thing on my laptop, I index Wikipedia in, I thought if it, I always forget if it two or three minutes, but that's the amount of uh, uh, English Wikipedia. Uh, but that's uh, the speed we're talking about. That's, uh, Wikipedia is like a, a tiny benchmark uh, in, in search. It's not a big data set. Uh, Yes, so uh, segments are independent uh, index. So you could decide to actually do your indexing on Hadoop and just copy the file of the segment uh, in the same place, and everything will work just the same. Uh, or you could decide to do a distributed search by sending the segment and dispatching them. It's really just copying files. It's very transparent. Uh, and because we write files and then we never touch them again, we just write very large file and, and then they're read only. Uh, there is no like problem of locks or anything. Uh, readers just like read the file and nobody is touching them, so it simplifies a lot of uh, my work. I have a bunch of slides there. <laughs> Let's keep them so that you, we have a, a bit of time to, uh, to, to, to ask questions. Uh, so do you guys have questions? Yeah. Uh, I'll try to say that well. Uh, Lucene is a little bit of a corner case for Java. Okay? It's like basically a library which is difficult for Java to handle because there's lots of uh, low level uh, stuff going on. Mm -hmm. So, what about your project and the Rust? Do they fit together, or did you find like trouble using Rust as you evolve? Uh, so, yeah, I, I wanted to see the little card. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, the question is: uh, uh, Is uh, Rust and building a search engine a, a good fit? I guess and with especially in contrast with uh, Lucene and, uh, and Java. So I, I would say yes. Uh, so the main benefit that I get from Rust, I guess, compared to Java is first I can access uh, SIMD instruction. Second, I uh, have a lot of control of, I, I know when I write code whether I'm going to get static dispatch or dynamic dispatch. That's something that is extremely hard in Java. You never know what happens. Um, also, all of the things uh, like MMAP, MMAP being a nightmare in Java, uh, it's uh, something that I, I don't have any problem about. I, I don't know if everyone knows what I'm talking about, but 
basically when you're working with ORFIP memory in Java, uh, like if you are mapping a huge amount of data and you have very little data that is on your heap, uh, your data will be unmapped only at the moment where the object that is holding the mmap uh, thing is garbage collected. And garbage collection happens only if your heap is actually like kind of full. Uh, that's a, that's a, I, I think that's a, that's a big problem uh, with Java. So, so some JVM uh, give you a, a non-official Java API to unmap stuff. Some people just like decide to use GNI call to do the mmap. Well, I never have that kind of problem with uh, with Rust. Uh, everything I'm I'm working with, with C or C plus <laughs> plus uh, And when I started this project, I didn't know Rust at all, and I started on TV to actually learn Rust, the, which is a bit stupid and crazy. Uh, so I, I was I already knew C plus plus, and I I had done a lot of Java as well. And after around two weeks, uh, you don't have to believe me, but I was more productive in Rust, and and, and I felt safer uh, writing code in Rust, and I was in both Java and C plus plus. Yeah. Can you explain the name and the logo of the Morse? Mm-hmm. Um. So TomTV uh, is an English word. I often do that, actually. Uh, I, I like uh, choosing English words that nobody knows <laughs> <laughs> as uh, project names. Uh, it's actually not bad at all for SEO. And uh, yeah, people learn a new word, so <laughs> everybody's happy, right? Uh, so TomTV means uh, at full gallop, uh, and the horse. Okay. And, uh, I, I drew the horse myself. I think that's uh, one of the best achievements uh, <laughs> in the project. Yes? Uh, 